where we can characterize materials up to nanometer. And device characterization is specific to the application. So generally, whatever uh, device group is there making the devices, they have the device characterization facility with them. The material characterization is centralized facility. And uh, now DRDO is trust, the trust is on productionizing through production centers and industry partners. As we are a semiconductor lab, you know till now, semiconductor industry is a very capital intensive industry. So you do not have a very big ecosystem of semi for semiconductors in the country till now. But with the National Semiconductor Mission, we are hoping that we will get enough semiconductor industries which can carry forward whatever we develop at lab level. So in the past, what has happened is whatever we have developed at lab level, if we have to deliver a certain number, we used to do it in the lab itself. But somewhere in the mid-80s, we started developing our own production center. Finally, we have two production centers. One for three, five gallium arsenide, gallium nitride, which is called GATEC at Hyderabad. And then we have a uh, center called Star C that is at Bangalore and it works on all the MEMS technology and other sensors. So these are our two production centers. And we have a very active interaction with the academia. And now the emphasis from the other side is also that we have to interact with academia. So whenever we take up a project, we have uh, uh, the design and whatever academic I can contribute, we are looking towards it. And the thrust is also that whenever we take up a project, right now, because we have to convert that uh, whatever we have developed into a product, so we have to hold, hand hold the industry partner also, right at the beginning when we conceive the project. So this is the model which DRDO is following right now and what we are also following right now. So basically, these are our area of work. We are working in a variety of fields. We are about uh, 350 scientists, uh, 350 personnel with 150 scientists and 150 of uh, technical staff. And we work in the area of RF devices, basically gallium arsenide, gallium nitride. And we start right from the material to the device to productionization at GATEC as I mentioned. And then we also work on optoelectronic devices, which are laser diodes and also some IR detectors. And for realizing these detectors, whatever materials are required, that is the three arsenide, nitride, antimonide, we grow those using uh, our own uh, systems. Uh, basically, we do a lot of epitaxy also. And we do some bulk growth also of semiconductors, as you can see. Then we also, another important area which we work are the sensors. So we have a variety of sensors which uh, are developed based on the micro electromechanical system, that's the mesh sensor based on saw sensors and also acoustic sensors and sensors based on carbon nanotubes. And for a variety of devices, we need a lot of cooling. So we have developed several cooling technologies also, Stirling cooler, JT cooler and thermal cooler. And right now we are taking up, uh, for the last few, four years, we are working in both quantum technology and terahertz technology. These are at the seeding stage. So these are some of the products which we have developed. Basically all are semiconductor products. So some solar cells, impact diodes, quadrant detectors. These are, uh, say, uh, we can say the timeline up to 90. These were, these were what we were developing. And then we also developed some ferrite material and then phase shifters based on that. And they were productionized at Cell Sahiba Bar and they are used in the Rajendra radar. Now this radar is being phased out. So this technology is going out of production. And uh, some of the uh, products which we have based on gallium arsenide, these are uh, the uh, used for the space program by ISRO, uh, which are being used in cartosite, rysite, and all. And we also developed some laser diodes for all these three arsenides, three nitrates, the production center is gated. And as I said, the cryogenic technology, the GJT cooler, Stirling cooler, and thermal electric cooler. So we have also developed a variety of sensors based on different, and we have. Uh, the number of facilities, we have a bulk growth facilities, we have germanium Dukrovsky and we have Richmond growth and for silicon carbide, which is a technologically important material, we have a TDP reactor and we have a potential growth facilities that is MOBP and MB. And as I said, the material characterization facility, the nano fabrication facility and the semiconductor processing facility and several test and measurement facilities as required. 
So uh, coming to some of the advanced materials we have developed in the recent past. Uh, one important ma material which we have developed is the silicon carbide single crystal rule. Silicon carbide is a very important material. It's a wide band of material with a very good thermal conductivity. And it is used as a substrate for all the three nitride epitaxy which we subsequently do. And right now we also have silicon carbide based power devices which are coming in for the EV uh, applications. And uh, these are the specifications. Basically we grow four inch wafers. So we do right from the silicon carbide ingot. This is a very tough technology because the temperature melting point is very, very high and uh, to control the composition and the, uh, you know, the micro pipe density across the three inch wafer, which has to be processed. We cannot afford any non-uniformity of properties along the wafer. So these are typically the specifications. And after making the ingot, we have the facility to slice the wafers and process it into substance. So the lapping, polish, cutting, lapping, polishing, everything is done at SSPL. And this is one technology which uh, we have developed recently. And on the silicon carbide substrate, we have grown uh, for RF electronics, algal based layers. And you can see this structure here, which is a hemp uh, structure. And basically on silicon carbide, you have to grow different layers, starting from aluminum nitride to gallium nitride to aluminum nitride, again a spacer layer. For thickness is varying from 2 micron to 1 nanometer. And all this is done using what is called, the technique is called MOCVD. I don't know if you have heard of it. It's metal organic chemical vapor deposition. And the challenge here is that each of these layers has to be grown at a different temperature. And you have to have very atomically sharp interfaces also. So these are the challenges. This vertical uh, growth process has to be optimized. And then we have uh, developed the device grade material. Uh, it is not as trivial as it sounds because it takes a lot of iterations and uh, characterization before we reach there. And so then we can uh, look at the on wafer uniformity and run to run repeatability. And typically, this is the AMS, AFM uh, uh, measuring the surface roughness, which is as good as state of art material available. Then we also have a molecular beam effect. Why I am showing this slide is here you have to grow what we call that super lattice layers. 3 nanometer, 0.3 nanometer, and 3 nanometer. And these have to be grown about 300 to 500 periods. This is a strain layer epitaxy in which the strain has to be balanced. So this is a challenge and then you can see the TEM. You can see the atomically uh, sharp interfaces and the HRZ study characterization which we do shows enough satellite peaks which speak about the interface sharpness. So these are the requirements which we have for these materials. Coming from material to technology, basically GAN hem technology is a very important technology we are working on. This basically is a white band gap material which can be used at high temperatures and uh, uh, high frequency applications. And this is a challenging technology in the sense that once I have grown the material, I give it for device fabrication. A number of process steps have to be done before we realize here you can see the wafer. Uh, this is the process wafer. This is a full 3 inch process wafer in which these devices have been fabricated. This is one technology I would, the process which I would like to draw your attention. This is what is called basically a wire hole. This wire hole has a less than a micron dimension. And these have to be, basically the substrate is about 300 uh, micron, which is thin, lapped down to 100 micron. And then you have to make these holes, keeping the geometry intact. So this is the kind of work you have to do when you come to a semiconductor plant or a semiconductor industry. So this is a very challenging process. And then you also have, when you make a circuit, it's not just a hemp device. You have to have a inductor and a capacitor and a resistor. So all these have to be designed and put in place so that you would have a, you know, uh, MMIC, you know, uh, wafer like this. And these are some of the devices which we have uh, grown, a power amplifier, a low noise, and a switch. All these three are designed so that uh, uh, you, in combination, circuits are designed and you have what are called the MMICs. These are GAN-based MMICs, which have, uh, this is, for example, one uh, C2KU band, these have, these are very important and useful for radar applications. 
basically the advantage of value on Android is compared to what we have today, the size of the radar comes down. So the weight also comes down and because of which it can even be put on an aircraft. What uh, we call the ISA radar, actively electronically scanned radar. So this is for that application. And these are basically not available to us in large numbers from anywhere. So they have to be developed individually. And then all we also work on uh, gallium arsenide based laser diodes for various different applications. And depending on the user requirement, we have to you know, make them for different output power in different kind of packages. And even for fiber coupled laser diodes uh, as uh, required by the user. So all this is, uh, you can see some of the applications for de uh, detonation and for the pumping of uh, uh, high other lasers for which can be used as a direct energy weapon. So these are the requirements. Uh, and again, the pilot production for this is gated. So this is typically a process for a laser diode. So you have to have, for instance, in a GAN, you have a 17 mask uh, process end to end before you get the circuit. So all that has to be done. So similarly, this is a, a typical uh, process fab, uh, sequence for the laser diode. So you have uh, metallizations, you have mesas, you have anti-reflection coating, you have passivations, and then you have your cleavage to form the cavity, and finally you get your laser diode. Then we also are currently working on blue green laser diode uh, technology. This is a development for underwater application. So then we also work on a number of sensor technologies. So these are uh, these sensors are based on the micro MEMS, that's the microelectromechanical system, and these are again used as fuses, electronic fuses in the place of mechanical fuses, and these are highly in demand and uh, they are very miniaturized and uh, they are again. This technology we productionize at a place called Star C. We have a center where all our men's technologies are productionized to supply the required number for our uh, users. Then we have acoustic emission sensor. These sensors are used for avalanche prediction in the uh, so basically this is the sensor. So the sensor and the sensor system, these are based on preserved composite materials. The sensors are made and packaged as per the user requirement and they are deployed in high altitude because we have want to do avalanche prediction for our different forces who are deployed in the uh, high altitudes. So now this sensor system plus the data acquisition system because the sensors are placed where the avalanche is expected and then you have to generate a lot of data. So these are placed and data is collected throughout the year. And this is uh, then given to the user who then develops a model for avalanche, avalanche predictions. So this is one technology we have been working on. And as a you know, consequence of this, we are also working on landslides. So this is also one technology we are working on. It's a similar principle, the design is different. And the same thing that you have to place your sensors at vulnerable areas and collect enough data so that you can develop a model for prediction in future. The model is not our job, we basically develop the sensors. Sensor and the sensor system. Then we have several saw based sensors also. We have what is called the Inasica, which uh, recently has been qualified for uh, chemical warfare agent detection and uh, for toxic gases also. And then we have saw based signal processing devices and then uh, one wireless passive physical sensor. This is very important because there are several places where you would like to know what is the temperature during operation. So when you have a temporary, when, uh, suppose you have a turbine rotating at very high speed and you cannot place your sensor there, you need to have a, in a wireless mode. So this is a possible solution which we have taken up recently. And uh, basically you have the sensors mounted on the, wherever you want the temperature during operation. And then you have an interrogator unit 
which uh, sends a signal and you can collect data so that you get a real time picture of what is happening while the system is operating. This is basically the same thing. And then we have a CNT based uh, chemical sensor. CNT work was done about uh, seven years back, and based on that, some sensors have been developed for chemical uh, for detection of ammonia and uh, NO2. And uh, this has been now tested, and we have made the prototype. And this has to go for, it has been given to some users so that they can test it out. So that, uh, again, the fabrication from this, we are uh, now doing at Star Sea. It's not yet started, but this is what we plan to do. Then recently, we have uh, three years back, we have started this Lara Hudson Quantum Initiative. So we were talking about, uh, again, we have a men's based Lara Hudson detector. We have, we have just developed the single element detector. Basically, it's a metamaterial uh, based detector. The metamaterial has been designed and fabricated, and the device has shown terror response. So now we have to go in for an array to make the actual device and then go for the optics and so on to make the uh, complete subsystem. Then, uh, for terra and sources, you have a broadband photoconductive material which can uh, be used as a source of terahertz and it also can be used in the detection mode. So for this, we had to develop a special material, which is called the LT gallium arsenide and LT indium gallium arsenide. So uh, this material is not available to us from anywhere. So this is also done in house, and we made this. Uh, we are now in the process of developing. This work is still going on. Then uh, zinc telluride is another uh, terahertz material which you are working on again for terahertz transmission and terahertz detection purposes. And our material has been there is a very active group at TRFR which uh, works has been working in this area. So we have given our substrates to them whatever we have developed. They have tested it and now they are uh, in the process of developing the complete terahertz uh, system for imaging using this. Then uh, graphene based also some terahertz uh, modulator and detector has been developed. This has been demonstrated. Now we have to work further uh, to develop the systems. Then there is a quantum sensors initiative also. Basically we are working on two applications which is ultra small atomic clock and magnetometer. This is to, for providing wherever there is no GPS, you need to have a, a, the uh, communication. So the atomic clock is targeted for that and magnetometer for underwater application for uh, uh, detecting the magnet, basically ultimately for submarine detection. But these are at the nascent stage and when we, the concept is there and the design is there, but when we are actually executing it, you see that there is a lot of gap in the electronics which we need to develop. And so that is what we are right now looking at. So these are some of the things which may be of interest to all of you. So if you want to know basically how uh, DRDO is interested in really working with the academia, right now there is a strong thrust on uh, DIA COE, that is the defense uh, industry and academic centers of excellence, about uh, 15 of them have been opened in various IITs and IISC and you can look at our website on a range of technology. Basically the idea is to build multidisciplinary collaborative teams for development of advanced technology for futuristic design. So they want to, the student community, the academia, the niche technology industries, they have to come together to provide these solutions. And the other way in which you can, uh, academia can collaborate with us is through the, our director of uh, ER and IPR, in which basically you submit project proposals and uh, they screen them for the application to business. And then if they get through the screening, then uh, they are sent to the uh, domain lab, whichever is interested, and then they are evaluated and the process for further uh, sanction. Then apart from ER APR, we also have four research goals, our aeronautical armaments, life sciences, and naval. You can just go through the website and you can see where, whatever work you are doing, where it fits. And then uh, there is another mode in which basically this is initiated at the lab, like we initiate this. Suppose we have a project and we have a need, we have a gap somewhere which needs to be filled, like knowledge gap or technology gap. 
then basically how would we go about it is we look at literature and see look around us and see who has some experience in this field so then we contact them and then try to take proposals from them have discussions with them and see if they can be of help to us to fill that knowledge gap so most projects now we have one or two cast proposals right at the initial stage before the project is taken up this is planned and we have several cast projects now about i think about 30 of them going on and uh, we have successfully worked in this mode with academia and basically for like i showed you the p2sl and the uh, hem structures structure simulations we have a qcl structure which needs to be simulated so for simulation we need the help of academia and also for computational and thermal management and so on and uh, we have also worked for process development suppose there is a gallium nitride and we need some hn so that problem somebody can take up and you know develop the hn with repeatability with the surface characteristics we can need and so on and uh, some even metallization schemes so it depends on basically what the uh, researcher brings to the table if it is of interest to us then uh, we have uh, very active interactions with them and uh, this is all basically one thing i forgot to say here is that we have a very active students training program so if anybody wants to work here i would recommend at least 6 months of training if you can take you can work in any of these areas you can uh, approach us still and we are open to providing that thank you Yeah, it was a brilliant lecture. So the lecture was basic, basically it was on advanced semiconductor materials and devices. But the way that you have covered the various aspects, starting from the basic material, then the sensors and the technology and everything, I think it was completely a complete lecture. And more about the last part, I like the most. Where you have focused the interaction between the industry and the and the other institution. And moreover, you have mentioned that how the different, even the student, they can take benefit of the different initiative. Now, the, once again, I thank you, and I would like to uh, join me thanking Madam Padmanabhi for the brilliant lecture. The floor is open for one or two questions. Thank you. Thank you. Any question? Relevant question? We are from Kolkata, and we have one micro and data science technology department. Actually, where uh, where uh, we have one step up for uh, one fabrication laboratory, they are doing process and others that you are talking about, and we have synthesized one perovskite material also, and studied some like uh, JCPTS data, like extra XRD and others, and we have seen that it is very good material. It has been tested. But for other study, that uh, absorption and other kind of study, we cannot go beyond that because we have no uh, such facilities. And uh, the university, university infrastructure, the university is not providing us that kind of facility. But students are very interested, and we are also very much interested to uh, to give that uh, human resource that are demanding now. Nations are demanding semiconductor. Now my question is. Whether you are giving support to this kind of any uh, characterization facility is available at SSPL, you can definitely write to the director, and uh, we actively support any uh, thing which is, we have. If we have the facility, then uh, we can work out a schedule, and you can come and plan it with the relevant groups. Okay. So you then uh, first you can write to the director, and then she will redirect the mail to the uh, concerned people. So. Then the interaction can start. I mean, there is nothing which we don't uh, do if the requirement is there. We can always. Then you can submit some proposals also for this proposal. For project for proposals, the... if you want to submit, it is through the ER and IP. More. So you just go through the website, as I said, and then you, there are forms are also available. So you can just have a look at it, and uh, you can send the proposals to ER and IPR, and uh, they will just have a look at it. As I said, ER and IPR basically looks at if there is a difference applicable. So then they redirect it to the uh, whatever domain lab. So that is how it works. Okay, funding is there. So, but you have to go through the process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And as a ma uh, madam very clearly, clearly mentioned that it is better you go through the website because the time is very limited. So my point is that if you have any question relevant to the lecture, please come back.
No question. Once again, I request to join me in thanking for the Thank you very much. I invite the next speaker. Thank you very much, ma'am. I request the Sachin Chairperson to kindly present the memorandum to our speaker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. Okay. Yeah, may I invite the next speaker, Professor Chaprav from Mumbai. Unfortunately, I don't have any CV of yours, so I would request you please introduce yourself for two minutes. Please. Okay. Yeah. So what we can say about, about our next professor, Professor Samantal Chakon. Let me give you a brief introduction about him. Professor S. L. Chakra is an INSA senior scientist at Bhaga Atomic Research Center, Mumbai. Earlier, he was director of the physics group at PARC. He is an electric fellow of the Indian National Science Academy and the National Academy of Science. An academician in the Asia Pacific Academy of Materials. He was selected as an outstanding referee by American Physical Society. He received the DAE Homi Bhava Award for Science and Technology. He served as the President of the Indian Physics Association and the President of the Neutron Scattering Society of India. Let's put your hands together. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this invitation. And uh, okay. Uh, okay, I have uh, seven colleagues at the ARC, and uh, as you know, this we interface between theory and experiments. Our previous speaker strongly advocated uh, that, and in fact, uh, I really support it because uh, uh, unless you join the two together, you live in isolation and you cannot go very far. Uh, uh, we have done experiments, we have facilities at the Baba Atomic Research Center and uh, also some other neutron spectrum centers. Uh, so, let me introduce. Uh, Subtopics that uh, we work on in the 
So the subtopics we work on uh, are, uh, you see, dynamics in solids, uh, there are two kinds of things. Uh, we have periodic dynamics like phonons, etc. And we also have uh, stochastic dynamics like the Okay. And uh, so uh, we primarily use the technique of uh, neutron uh, scattering. Uh, there are two uh, varieties, uh, inelastic scattering and quasi-elastic scattering. That's different to, uh, and you can see the periodic dynamics as uh, that variety. And now, uh, because these are so complex in uh, complex uh, structures, uh, you heavily depend on computational models of the dynamics. So, uh, inelastic scattering is used for to study periodic dynamics, and quasi elastic scattering is used to study the kind of things it has is the common dispersion relations or uh, diffusion and data analysis are done by. That is dynamics and molecular dynamics. Uh, if you go a little further, uh, see, the, so neutron scattering is like Raman scattering. The, essentially, what happens is you have uh, uh, an incoming radiation, uh, you have a sample, and you have an outgoing radiation in uh, different directions, and uh, you look at the energy and momentum conservation. So, like in Raman scattering, the, the radiation. Energy changes and the change in energy is related to what uh, excitations uh, we are talking about. And similarly, there is a change in momentum. Uh, in uh, in uh, diffraction experiments, for example, this is very different. So, what you need to really look at it is uh, the change in energy and momentum of the neutron scattering, neutron radiation, and uh, that allows you to study the, uh, the dynamics. Okay, just. Uh, Bit more. Uh, so, if you plot, for example, uh, how much the energy of a neutron changes against the intensity of uh, this process, then at uh, like zero energy transfer, what you essentially have is a diffraction, and this kind of thing we can we use to study the structure in crystallography. Uh, if the elastic line is broadened, okay, this uh, there is some resolution of the instrument, so there is certain. Uh, the width of the elastic line, but if there is a further broadening, then this is related to stochastic motion. So, if you have, for example, diffusion uh, of atoms uh, in a crystal, then uh, that would give you the broadening of the elastic line. Okay, and the the width of this is related to the correlation times, or uh, so can be related to diffusion coefficients and so on. Uh, in, uh, just show that, and uh, like uh, phonons or other excitations, they show up at this, show up at finite uh, energy transfers. You have process like energy gain and energy loss, very similar to what you have in Raman scattering. So very similar to the Raman scattering, uh, you have uh, you can measure uh, excitations both with energy gain of the instant radiation or energy loss. So, uh, this is just a lesson, I don't get to just a little bit too old. Now, uh, here, because in battery materials, our primary, our focus is on uh, ionic uh, conductivity, and ionic conductivity is determined by diffusion of atoms. Now, diffusion, as I said, uh, we can investigate by quasi elastic scattering, that is the broadening of the elastic line, uh, how it changes as uh, is a function of energy and momentum. And uh, so uh, the quantity that is measured is what is called the dynamical structure factor. It is simply the probability of uh, scattering as a function of uh, change of the momentum and change of the energy. Okay, this is uh, H cross Q will be the momentum and H cross omega will be the energy. Okay, and so here again the, there is certain elastic part which is due to the uh, time average structure. 
and uh, there is a quasi elastic part. So the, the broadening part we fit it with a Lorentzian function. Okay, so if you fit it with a Lorentzian function, uh, then uh, this width of the Lorentzian uh, can be related to the uh, different kinds of uh, uh, modes of the dynamics. So this is a fairly involved process, but uh, well, I don't have to bore you with all that. I mean, just to give a clever that these are the kind of things that are done. So you do the fitting and so on. And then uh, the, the width of the Lorentzian function, that is the width of the broadening of the elastic line uh, as a function of the momentum transfer can be related to certain models. This is one of the simplest models that gives you what are, for example, the in, a, in crystal lattice, atoms not diffuse exactly like a liquid. They may be jumping from side to side and uh, there is certain time it takes for uh, jump and so on. So the typically one can think of a, a jump a time, or residence time between two jumps, how long the atom has stayed one place on the average. This is stochastic, so these are not fixed numbers. And then the diffusion coefficient uh, can be can be found by such a So this is one of the simplest uh, processes uh, for models. Now, uh, coming to uh, certain specific uh, uh, aspects, so we are interested in uh, lithium or sodium diffusion. So for lithium, you are very well familiar with the lithium 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 batteries uh, are used. And uh, right now, uh, what one is interested in is whether you can improve upon the uh, solid materials. I mean, like lithium in a liquid state would be different, but then solid electrolyte is something that is a focus on, uh, which are uh, uh, more convenient to handle and uh, get, there are certain advantages. So, can you alternatively sodium because lithium again is in short supply and there is some problems and sodium may have again. So, there is a focus on uh, sodium battery materials. Okay. Now, but as uh, basic scientists uh, were, were interested in the atomic level uh, understanding of these materials, what are we interested in? Okay, crystal structure is one that crystallographers can look at and so on. Uh, what we are looking at it is uh, the diffusion <coughs> pathways and time scales. So within a given crystal or within a given solid, what are the diffusion pathways uh, and what are the time scales at which the diffusion processes take place and how this can be beneficially improved upon for practical uses. So this is what uh, is the eventual aim is. And then you can very well imagine that you are looking for low energy low energy barrier diffusion pathways. So, you know, if the energy barrier for diffusion is small, then those will provide those preferential or preferred pathways. And that is what we would like to find out uh, within the materials. And so these can be helped in various ways. Uh, the structural topology, I'll take an example. And the point effects are useful because then the vacancies or interstitials, they, they help in uh, the diffusion process. Another important thing is if you have an amorphous kind of structure, that has its own uh, uh, benefits. Uh, then uh, the other uh, aspect is whether you can flex the host lattice, the host crystalline lattice, by some stoichiometric engineering or different methods. Uh, then one of the things, a couple of things that we found is that uh, in uh, certain materials, if you have uh, polyhedra, uh, you know, some uh, groups like uh, SiO4. No, these, uh, so a lithium sulfate, for example, or lithium phosphate, uh, uh, the, uh, the can be the, uh, uh, a polyhedral group of atoms like PO4 or so forth. Its rotation is coupled with the translation of lithium atom. And so that is called a, a gear wheel mechanism, and uh, that kind of thing uh, helps in the. Uh, okay. Then we, uh, it is also found that the low energy phonons. Uh, you know, you have in uh, different structures, depending on the how the structure is engineered, uh, you may find that there are uh, very low energy phonons associated with the diffusing atom, uh, lithium or uh, sodium atom. Uh, as, as I said, the, the, it's not a liquid-like diffusion. So, for most of the time, the atoms are located at definite sites and they jump over from side to side. And that is how the ionic conduction of diffusion takes place. So, Low energy phonons and the eigenvector of these phonons uh, may be related to the low energy diffusion pathways. Uh, and moreover, the uh, softening of the phonons, that means the reduction in the phonon energy, 
or the phonon frequency as a function of temperature or thermal expansion or by other means so it can be supported. So this is the broad outline. Uh, now let me take uh, a few examples that we have investigated. Uh, okay, over the last uh, uh, couple of, uh, few years, or a couple of years, we have looked at uh, materials like uh, sodium aluminium silicate or lithium aluminium carbonate. These experiments were done at the Oakridge National Laboratory, and uh, uh, we have done uh, all the uh, okay. See, for the the way we operate is that. Uh, uh, we do certain preliminary work in uh, our center uh, and we uh, propose experiments to these uh, advanced laboratories and uh, we, we get the beam uh, time. Then we can use it and then uh, get the data, analyze, compare with our uh, models uh, or the computational uh, calculations and then try to make, get the things out of it. Uh, another is the amorphous materials. As I said, amortization also helps. Then uh, there is one recent paper that we have published is in, uh, in a, a sodium zinc medium uh, sulfide uh, material, where uh, the topology of the structure uh, is found to be very suitable for uh, to use the okay. And there are other some papers uh, recent on uh, phonons related aspects. Uh, these same technologies are also useful. Uh, for, uh, for example, uh, uh, solid oxide diffuse cells, where the diffusion of oxygen atoms uh, is uh, very important. So, diffuse cells uh, can be uh, uh, Okay, so the first example I will take is uh, lithium silicon oxygen. Okay. So, there are some experiments done at ICES, there is a Rutherford Appleton Laboratory in uh, Oxford. And what, we, what is known is that the crystalline uh, material does not exhibit a diffusion, but the uh, amorphous material shows the diffusion at some point. <coughs> and then it's uh, on further heating, it transforms to crystalline phase. So, what we find is that amorphization enables the lithium diffusion. It's a recent publication. Okay. So, uh, this is uh, the uh, the phonon density of states. Okay, uh, the neutron intensity. Uh, not it's not exactly neutron intensity, but converted into the uh, density of states uh, as a function of energy. And you find that see, normally we are familiar with the omega square kind of density of states or e square kind of density of states. Uh, so, but then uh, this is not just the acoustic region. Some of the phonons come into play, and uh, here. At room temperature, you have certain density of states, and then as the temperature is increased, there is a, a shift to lower energies uh, in this material. Uh, a bit, uh, okay, but this is marginal amount. Now, if you go to the amorphous structure, then uh, there is a, a lot more shift and a broadening. So, uh, qualitatively, one can associate that the softening of this low energy phonons. And we, we can find out from theoretical calculations uh, what is involved in these phonons. Okay, what kind of atomic dynamics or atomic motions are involved. So we, uh, this is through the theoretical calculations that, for example, uh, the, the mean square displacements uh, due, due to phonons uh, have these components. So you have a large component from the lithium atom. This is the same energy I'm talking about, about 5 to 10 million microvolts. So lithium has a large component. But then uh, sulfur and oxygen also, silicon and oxygen also have a large component. And uh, as we see by more detailed analysis, that the, uh, this uh, is about interpolatoral uh, dynamics, <coughs> dynamics that Okay, this is uh, data of the quasi elastic neutron scattering. So the elastic line, uh, we just shown the, the tail part of it. So you can see that with the increase in temperature, uh, this is at low temperature you have uh, uh, the, uh, essentially the resolution of the instrument. As you increase the temperature, there is a broadening of the elastic time and uh, you have some uh, kind of uh, increase in the intensity also because of phonons, but that can be, can be accelerated. So uh, this is fitted to a Lorentzian kind of function. And this uh, width of this Lorentzian function is plotted as a function of the 
moving to Alaska. Okay, and then this is fitted to certain kind of uh, models. So, what this essentially tells us, uh, so this process, you can identify that there is diffusion. Uh, you cannot still identify which atom is involved because purely experiment will not tell you that. Okay, for that you, there can be other methods, experimental methods, but uh, what we have done is through simulations. And uh, then you can find out what, so for example, the uh, average jump length of uh, the uh, lithium atom uh, is, uh, okay. so the jump length is uh, typically 4 Armstrong, which is related to some kind of particle distance. And then the typical jump time of maximum picoseconds, there will be certain issues in coefficient. Uh, okay. Uh, now you can also, for example, simple uh, if you, uh, calculation, molecular dynamics calculation, you can uh, calculate uh, the mean square displacements of atoms. So, in a, in a crystalline material, the mean square displacement does not change with time. So, these are you know, just the forms, uh, form of vibrations. So, the mean square displacement is uh, practically independent of time and it increases with the temperature. So, but this does not indicate if you uh, However, uh, if the mean square displacement increases with the time, this is a molecular dynamic simulation, then that indicates the diffusion. Okay, so in this amorphous material, uh, uh, and the, the diffusion coefficient is just proportional related to the slope of this uh, function, that is, uh, this so from that one can identify this. Then the other quantity that is uh, calculated is what is called a self-correlation function. So it's a correlation function between a lithium atom at, uh, at a given time and at a future time. Okay. So uh, if you calculate that, so in a crystalline material, what you find is that the, there is just one peak, and uh, so they typically let's say half an ounce strong. And this is related, related to just the mean square displacement for no kind of vibration. However, uh, in, a, in this uh, morpho structure where there is a diffusion, the self-correlation function shows uh, uh, first develops a second peak and then further uh, broadens and so on. So this indicates uh, how as a function of time uh, the atom is jumping from from the initial side to one of the sides. So that's uh, one can take it. Okay, then of course from the theory or simulations, uh, how much time do I have, sir? You can continue. Okay, fine. Thank you, sir. Uh, you can stop me anytime. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, if uh, uh, in the molecular dynamic simulation, uh, as you know, you calculate the trajectories of atoms as a function of time, uh, typically in the order of uh, picoseconds. <laughs> and uh, then, uh, if you look at this, then, for example, in this line material, the atoms are located at definite sites. Whereas, uh, if there is a diffusion taking place, then uh, this will not be so. So, these are just the probability isosurfaces plotted in. Initially, the temperature has to be uh, very high because uh, in a small simulation, see, in the real world, you know, you can go up to seconds or minutes and so on. But in simulation, uh, the typical time at which, at which the atomic trajectories have to be calculated uh, has to be a fraction of a picosecond. Okay, and precisely for that reason, uh, uh, but uh, if you increase the temperature, then you can accelerate the process. So, uh, I will just artificially done. Uh, all right, so uh, this way one can uh, identify or calculate uh, what are the, at the microscopic atomic level, what exactly is happening. Okay, then uh, if I look at, for example, let me uh, just pick up one atom and see how its uh, root mean square displacement is changing with temperature, then uh, in this line material it is a constant. Here, uh, uh, this is the displacement from the original position. So you can see that it shows some variation, then it shows a jump. So this is like a jump dynamics. Okay. And whereas in the in amorphous material is more a mix of uh, jumps as well as uh, a liquid like continuous process. So this is a microscopic understanding. And uh, if you do the detailed the latest dynamics calculations where you can calculate the phonons and phonon eigenvectors, then uh, you can identify specific phonon eigenvectors uh, at, for different phonons and see how 
the work that you do in this setting place. Okay, so what have we learned from uh, this essentially is that the molecular dynamic simulation revealed that in the one plus phase, uh, you have different orientations of uh, this uh, silicate polyhedra. There are several accessible pathways opened up for sodium diffusion. This is not available in this uh, crystalline material due to uh, definite text orientations. So we are not able to see it. I will take another uh, example uh, recently we have worked on. Uh, that is the uh, diffusion in this crystalline uh, material. So this uh, has uh, not too complex a structure, uh, but what we found, and here uh, you have uh, again this polyhedra, uh, zinc sulfide or titanium uh, sulfide and so on. So there is a network of this uh, polyhedra, and the sodium atoms occupy certain positions. Uh, these are in the crystal structure. There are definite Minkoff sites. Uh, thirty-two GVs in the unit cell. There are thirty-two positions available. Sixteen positions. So you know, a large number of positions are available in this uh, structure, and uh, so this is the uh, uh, structure. Okay, and we are trying to see okay what kind of features can uh, 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 I need to define it. Okay, so first these are the phonon uh, density of states measurements as a function of uh, temperature, and uh, what we essentially see here. Is that the the phonon peaks uh, broaden uh, with the increase of temperature, and uh, the broadening the uh, is like you know if you have harmonic phonons and it's uh, anharmonic interactions uh, lead to broadening of the phonon structure. Uh, then further we found that uh, the and through calculations you can identify uh, what are the different components of the phonon density of states. Uh, what like so. This would be called the partial phonon density of state, uh, which are atom specific. So the different atoms in the uh, in the material, you can see what are the contribution to the phonon dispersion curves. Uh, so uh, uh, the, the, the different atoms. So, okay, sodium, selenium, gallium, and so on. So what what we identified here is that the the key phonons where the significant bonding takes place are associated with the Sodium atoms at uh, upper time, 32 G, that means uh, it is just for sodium 1 and 2. So that has uh, a large uh, protein structure, whereas the other one has a very sharp structure. And then uh, and this, uh, these are calculations of the mean square displacements again, which uh, tell us that uh, the sodium of the 32 G side has a large component at this uh, low energy that is almost. Uh, uh, and look at the other kind of measurements, the quasi elastic neutron scattering. Uh, we do see the broadening as a function of temperature. And uh, then uh, this again, uh, the, the broadening of the elastic line as a function of neutral transfer is, uh, uh, is plotted. This is experimental data from the operation operational laboratory. And we can also have uh, corresponding calculations from the uh, the issue of regular dynamics uh, simulation and uh, okay, so this essentially helps in uh, validating the uh, simulations and then we use simulations for more detailed understanding of the underlying uh, microscopic physics. Okay, so what do we see here now? Uh, again, the, uh, yeah, but here again, uh, you see in the in the real structure, the diffusion. Uh, is helped by uh, defects of various kinds in a perfect crystalline structure, it's uh, more difficult. So, we have introduced some uh, small vacancies, and that allows us to identify the diffusion, which you can see for the, uh, how the mean square displacement increases with uh, time. Which are the diffusion. Uh, if you just look at this, you may feel it's like liquid like, but then uh, really it's uh, not liquid like, but strongly influenced by the underlying uh, radius. Uh, okay, this is again the uh, uh, distribution of the so, yeah. so, okay, what, what did we discover? Uh, see, we plotted the probability density of the sodium atoms, uh, which are initially located at uh, one of the two sides. And then we find that uh, uh, this 
there are definite pathways in this structure which are uh, connected and uh, the sodium, this particular kind of atoms, uh, they diffuse through. So, uh, whereas the other kind of atoms, that is the 16A, they don't have such kind of uh, diffuse uh, pathways and members. So, in fact, uh, this uh, would be the said that this is the, the topology of the structure is such that, that enables uh, certain pathways. And then these are, such, these are uh, you can see, some kind of a zigzag chains of the uh, sodium atoms uh, in a plane, and they are also they also have uh, uh, atomic diffusion or jumps across. So this is the AB plane in the crystal structure, and if you plot the BC plane, C is along the perpendicular direction. So uh, these chains uh, there are also jumps between the uh, between the chains uh, along the C direction, and. Uh, so this way we have identified what are the pathways and what is the topology of the structure that helps in uh, the process. So in uh, other materials, if you can identify uh, this kind of uh, topology, that would be helpful. Because these are again detailed uh, snapshots of how the jump dynamics uh, takes place uh, and what are the time scales. What also is the Okay, this is again the uh, self correlation function that tells that uh, how, for example, uh, as a function of time, uh, the second peak develops. So, you know, the, the first peak, this is the correlation, self correlation of the atom as a function of distance from the initial position at zero time. So, in the beginning, you have just the phonon kind of vibrations, and as time proceeds, uh, the atom would have jumped to another side at a distance. In a, so it is the same atom at a later time uh, is then located at a different uh, position again. So this helps us to identify what are the uh, jump lengths and jump times. Uh, okay, so now this part of the talk, uh, there are two things that are identified. So in the amorphous structure uh, due to the shallow pre energy landscape uh, attributed to random arrangement of Fourier units with large number of open minima, uh, which you can uh, copy. And then in the sodium uh, second uh, material, there is structural topology of the sodium atoms in uh, the chains of the certain sites that provides the pathway for sodium, the sodium diffusion. And the diffusion is enabled to be solved. Yeah, how much time, sir? So, in terms of further time, I will jump over to this another example uh, and just talk to the. Yeah. Okay, so just to summarize, uh, uh, okay, we have looked at uh, the diffusion pathways and time scales, and the structural topology and point effects. Uh, so then uh, the stoichiometric engineering can help in uh, identifying the diffusion processes by placing the post studies, the couple dynamics, uh, and the domain of the phonons. It was a fantastic lecture. It started with the Alachi devices, with the simulation of the experiment. For me, the beauty of this lecture is the physics and the atomic dynamic characteristics of the solid state material, which you have covered very nicely. I am not from the field, so I don't want to uh, draw myself in this. So I will throw the floor for the question. But any relevant question to the lecture, no suggestion, nothing like that. The direct question, please. Sir, uh, uh, we are not actually having this kind of lecture, but it was so fascinating. And uh, uh, I was involved in charge carrier transport in Guatemala and others. And we are, uh, I am trying to correlate with the molecular dynamics for you because we have done also human scattering and others. So my question is uh, uh, when you are deriving the time, it is a time dependent shorting equation. You have uh, this kind of energy vectors so very much on me. Uh, that uh, that uh, eigenvectors you are giving. Is it like that? 
and the flow is completely the molecular flow is happening naturally in the battery materials. Uh, yeah, yeah, good, yes. and the first thing is to if you want to calculate the Bonon spectrum, there are standard techniques of lattice dynamics. Okay, so that is how you calculate the phonon dispersion curves and the Okay, that's all. And second, uh, the diffusion is uh, molecular dynamics. Uh, the name is molecular dynamics, but it's only solving the neutron equations of motion. And uh, so, the, in a density functional theory calculation, the forces between atoms you get through the density functional theory. But uh, you still, once you got the forces, you are going to solve the neutron equations of motion for the atoms. Okay, and that allows you to get the how the atoms move as a function of time. So whether they are just vibrating about a fixed position, or they are jumping from side to side, or in a liquid, how they move, what kind of pathways. So this is what the molecular dynamics. And the harmonic attack, the phonon you can calculate. Phonon you can calculate. Uh, yes. So, uh, if you do a molecular dynamics calculation, then there is no restriction like harmony because uh, you are actually calculating as it is, and from that you can do some Fourier transforms, etc., for the position time, and get your uh, phonon structure. That is, uh, that will include both the harmonic and enharmonic structures. Okay. So, molecular dynamics. Uh, uh, there are certain limitations about what, how many atoms you can take and so on, but uh, it's a well uh, uh, developed technique to calculate phonon spectrum also, including at a, at a finite temperature, including harmonic and harmonic terms. And also look at stochastic part of the dynamics layer of the systems. <coughs> yeah, the illuminating and inciting phonon Mean the mean space displacement versus time, I was just wondering if uh, you have considered calculating the diffusion constant between Einstein's equation. So, I think the slope of the mean space displacement versus yes, time. Yes, yes, yes. That's the 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 that's so you can jump times and jump lengths. Third is uh, if you calculate the velocity autocorrelation function, and then uh, uh, the Fourier transform at zero energy you get a component which is very different. There are three different cases. Okay, and that will uh, you can, we have calculated the whole three methods. Try to see if there are differences or not, and if yes, then what they might be related. Yes, please. So very interesting talk. So the last I have a question, but I'll ask one question. Is the 32 G side is, is basically soft phonon and diffusion to faster than 16 F. Yes. But if I look at the near neighbor distance in phonons, it's the other way around. 16 F has 4.2 n strong distance. So educated guess is going to be if you have a larger space. True. So so that is near neighbor distance is not sufficient. You one must look at the Structural topology, how the atoms are located. Uh, see, suddenly you can imagine these are not the first numbers. Okay. In between, you have these polyhedral units, and so uh, it will to be seen. So, moreover, in this structure, you have just only one first number or one second number, there is a distribution, and so you calculate the pair distribution function to identify what is the distribution and so on. So, yeah, because yeah, I thought it's bonding is it's stronger. Very important. Yeah. yeah. Just uh, looking at the expert structure, you cannot jump to it. Thank you. Another question, please. Sir, uh, the, in, in one of your slides, I see the soft mode of phonon. Uh, does soft mode phonon means uh, imaginary frequency? Uh, no. Uh, imaginary frequency would not be soft, it will be unstable. Okay, because if you imaginary frequency, if you write, e to the power i omega t and if omega is imaginary then it will become e to the power minus omega square t some, uh, minus something t so that phonon will simply decay it will not be stable okay so imaginary frequencies refer to unstable vibrations they are not stable vibrations on the other hand soft phonon just means uh, crudely speaking very low frequency but uh, strictly speaking uh, there are phonons which are change, uh, decrease in frequency as a function of uh, temperature, for example, 
and then eventually can lead to best conditions. Yeah. Okay. So, but soft hormone means soft means uh, uh, very low frequency. Uh, but under some some kinds of perturbation or uh, yes. maybe some kind of strain uh, that uh, that may be uh, uh, transferred to the imaginary. No, then uh, so if that situation is uh, about to, as I said, for example, in uh, uh, strontium titanate or many second order phase transitions, the frequency will decrease, and then when it's approaching zero, your phase transition takes place. So if you still calculate beyond the phase transition, then it will give an imaginary frequency. Okay, so uh, uh, so imaginary frequency would be in the unstable structure. Okay, so then that structure could then transform to a stable structure which may have it a lower symmetry like the cubic strontium titanate uh, transfers to uh, okay or barium titanate uh, say to a tetragonal structure or thorombic structure or rhomboidal structure but the cubic structure has an imaginary frequency but not the so once uh, there is a, it becomes tetragonal then uh, it's no more imaginary. So one thing I want to do. Yeah, please, sorry. When chapter is around, so you can discuss the matter with the chapter during the coffee break or during the lunch hour. Okay. Because of the time limitation. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much for your chapter. Please join me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We would also like to present a moment to our honorable speaker. Thank you so much, sir. And for our next speaker, I would like to invite Professor Abhirudeh Sarkar to speak on the topic PMT perspective of metaphonics, phytoelectric, and his biography. I would like to say after having completed his PhD, after completing his PhD in 2004 from the Shahai Institute of Nuclear Physics, India, Professor D. Sarkar. At his first postdoctoral stint at the Fritz Harbour Institute of the Max Planck Society, Berlin, Germany, and the last one at Uppsala University, Sweden. In between, he served as a research scientist and engineer on a visiting investigative program between CENES and CNRS, France. And eight star Singapore, he has been the citizen of the President of India, Medal for the year 2000. Up to the date, he has published more than a thousand papers. He has guided hundred, hundred, not a thousand. <laughs> more than hundred papers. He has oh, guided five yes. students. Yeah, yes, that's my mentor. To the successful completion of their PhD and mentored postdoctoral fellowship. Please put your hands together to welcome them. So, Triple I Team Gwalior is uh, is a second home to me. Professor Ramurak Srivastava is a wonderful host. It's always great to be here. And I thank him for the opportunity to showcase our research findings at this wonderful international conference. Uh, okay. So this is the title of my talk as she read it out. Okay. And, uh, so first of all, I would like to acknowledge my group of PhD students, both uh, past as well as present. Because today I'll be presenting the work done exclusively with my PhD students. Neelkant Tripathi is standing next to me. This picture was taken on his birthday and he is here in the audience and he will be presenting a poster. The cake is missing in the picture. I'm sorry for that. So, apart from the pursuit of our independent theoretical research, we also collaborate with experimentalists and we provide them with a strong theoretical support. So, if time permits, I, I would like to touch upon some of our collaborative such collaborative work where, where we have provided theoretical support to experimentalists. Okay, so uh, this is how we talk in for the night. So broadly speaking, we got to research on 2D materials for different kinds of energy conversion and next generation electronics. So I'll start off with valleytronics beyond single layer immersion, which will be uh, followed by our the theoretical predictions of these monolayers for flexible piezoelectronics. And then, so we have a few selected monolayers and banner walls, heterobilayers will be covered in this talk. 
And serendipitously, we have come across an open contact in this Van der Waals hetero bilayer. That will also be. Uh, I'll, I'll also talk about that in this in this talk. Okay, and the workhorse which has been employed in our scientific computations comprise of uh, density functional theory based approaches as implemented in class. So, as we are all aware, novel properties arise at the nano scale, which are usually non existent in the bulk form of the materials. You can use molybdenum disulfide, the most widely studied two dimensional semiconductor, as an example to understand that. So, molybdenum, molybdenum disulfide comprises of a multi layered Van der Waals solid. And when it is thinned down to the level of a monolayer, so as we are moving from the bulk to the nano scale, several interesting properties arise like this and that. So, but we are particularly interested in this one. So, as we are moving from a bulk multi layered Van der Waals solid MOS2 to a single layer MOS2, what happens is that this point group symmetry changes, the symmetry is lower, the inversion symmetry is broken, as a result of which piezoelectricity as well as valetronic properties arise in single layer MOS2. Now, theory has preceded experiments in several instances, including the prediction of piezoelectricity in two dimensional materials. Piezoelectricity in two dimensional materials was predicted, was in this paper, uh, was discussed in this paper, in this JPCL paper in 2012. And then, in a few years down the line, it has been observed and confirmed experimentally in these two papers from the Nature Group. And the origin of piezoelectricity is the broken inversion symmetry. As you can see, this is the supercell of uh, MOS2. Here, the two atoms are different, so the inversion symmetry is broken here. Therefore, it shows piezoelectricity. Yeah. And however, in graphene, both the atoms are the same. The inversion symmetry is present in graphene. Therefore, it doesn't show any piezoelectricity. And experimentally, it has been demonstrated that molybdenum disulfide containing odd number of layers show piezoelectricity. However, MOS2 containing even number of layers. Uh, the inversion symmetry is present in it and therefore it doesn't show any piezoelectricity. So only odd number of layers of MS2 exhibits piezoelectricity, not even ones, due to the occurrence of inversion symmetry in it. And likewise also, the single layer MS2 shows this valetronic properties, valley hall effect. I'll be talking about that in the next few slides. The bilayer doesn't show. As you can see here, the bilayer, the curve is the valley hall voltage is black. It doesn't vary with the voltage. <coughs> Now, apart from the charge and the spin degrees of a freedom of an electron, another degree of freedom arises in a single layer uh, MOS2. As you can see, the inversion symmetry is broken here. This is the top view of MOS2. The two atoms are different here. The inversion symmetry is broken. Therefore, the opposite spins are, uh, are locked to this momentum value. This K and K prime becomes distinguishable in MOS2. In, in the graphene lattice, in a single layer pristine graphene lattice, all the atoms are that of carbon, and therefore K and K prime are not distinguishable in graphene. So this K and K prime, or K and minus K, can play the role of zeros and one in electronics, and therefore it can be used to store, encode, and process information. And also you can see in the band structure plot here, opposite spins are locked to these momentum <coughs> values. So first of all, you need to generate carriers in these values. How you would do that? That is by using light of appropriate polarization. Like you need a left circularly polarized light to populate this plus k value, and a right circularly polarized light to generate carriers in this minus k value. Then, like in uh, all effect, when you when experimentally you study Hall effect, you need to turn on the electric field, and then the carriers in this value they experience an effective magnetic field in k space which is due to an intrinsic property of the material having a broken inversion symmetry and spin orbit coupling. So that is the bending curvature. And higher the spin orbit coupling, usually higher is the bending curvature and higher the value polarization. So this is a V cross V kind of a term here. So the carriers in this value, upon the application of the in-plane electric field, they, they acquire a transfer, this anomalous transfer velocity and the carriers in this valley, they undergo a Hall effect, and which is called the anomalous or the valley Hall effect. And very few materials are experimentally known which exhibit the valley, uh, the valley Hall effect. I mean, those materials are mainly MOS2 light, which show a large Zeeman type spin splitting at the valence band and a very small splitting at the conduction band. 
So since this is an emerging field of research, in order to facilitate the development of this area, we have contributed a few monolayers. We have proposed a few 2D materials which uh, show properties complementary to that of MLS2. So this is our little contribution to this area. And I'll be mainly focusing on these two uh, papers, these two works in this talk. So this HFN2 monolayer was predicted using the particle swarm optimization technique as implemented in Calypso. But we have explored the varitronic properties in this imperium. It shows a large Zeeman type value spin spinning at the conduction band edge, which is complementary to that of MOS2. It shows a large splitting at the uh, balance band. Now, if you replace sulfur by tellurium, uh, if you replace sulfur by a heavier uh, element, that is tellurium, the spin orbit coupling will be higher, and as a result of which the, the splitting will also be higher in this case. So, when HFN2 monolayer is stacked on top of a molybdenum telluride, so to, to form a Van der Waals hetero bilayer, a type 2 band alignment arises in it. So, as a result of which, we are able to realize a large Zeeman type value spin splitting at both the conduction band and the valence band. So, this will be ideally suitable for valetronics applications because in Van der Waals hetero bilayer, I mean, so one can uh, prolong the lifetime of very polarized excitons. So I will talk about the type 2 band alignment in the next few slides. So then moving on, we have also proposed these monolayers for the integration of valetronics with spintronics. This niobium nitride monolayer or tantalum nitride monolayer, they have a hexagonal honeycomb lattice and a polar buckled structure. Because of the polar buckled structure, an out of plate electric field intrinsically arises in it and which induces uh, momentum dependent spin splitting, these out of plane electric field, and uh, that gives rise to a Rashba constant. This is the Rashba constant is quantified by this uh, parameter, and higher the Rashba constant, it is better for spin tronics application. So, for a material which is having a high Rashba constant and suitable for applications in spin tronics, where so spin degrees of freedom are utilized. And also, it has a large spin orbit coupling, and the inversion symmetry is broken, and therefore, it shows a high very curvature which is much higher than several two-dimensional materials. So this should also a reasonably good Rashba constant. And therefore, we propose that these uh, monolayers will be suitable for the integration of valetronics with spintronics. And also, what we find here is that these two-d materials are stretchable and flexible. They have a low elastic stiffness constant. And therefore, it is worthwhile studying uh, the response in the material properties to the application of mechanical strain. That is what we have done over here. Under the application of mechanical tensile strain, what happens is that the band gap is reduced, so which increases the very curvature, and the effect of the compressive strain is just the opposite. And also, what you guys we can observe over here is that niobium nitride it has a smaller band gap and therefore a higher very curvature as compared to MOS2. Okay, it's time to switch the gear to flexible field source spintronics. The next generation channel semiconductor demand the seamless merger of these properties. It needs to show a large uh, Rashba constant or a high spin orbit coupling and a high and a out of plane piezo electricity so that the external gate voltage source can be replaced by the intrinsic piezo potential under the application of external pressure or strain. And then low dimensional materials are by default, they have a low elastic stiffness constant, and so they are, therefore they are flexible and stretchable. Such a pointer was given in this uh, ACS Nano paper by, from the, by the group of Beryl Wong on one dimensional for one dimensional zinc oxide nanowires and we have extended this concept to two dimensional materials. So we have proposed a couple of monolayers which show a combination, which exhibit a combination of all these three properties like ZNT and CTT monolayers, they have a polar buckle structure and a hexagonal honeycomb lattice as well and because of this structure, polar buckle structure has been mentioning to you that intrinsically uh, an out of plane electric field arises which uh, induces uh, momentum dependent spin splitting in the conduction band as you can see. So one parabola it splits into two parabola. This is the momentum dependent spin splitting and this is the Rashba constant. And you need a high Rashba constant for spin tronics application. And also uh, we are aware that spin orbit coupling is proportional to Z to the power 4. So cadmium is heavier than zinc so therefore it shows a larger Rashba constant. And also, because of the broken inversion symmetry, an out-of-plane electric field arises in them, in CDT and ZNT. 
Likewise, the, uh, the, the same thing is observed. Uh, the same thing applies to MGT. So in summary, these three monolayers show a combination of all these three properties. They show a low elastic stiffness constant. So this is this criteria is satisfied. And they uh, have a high rush per constant and out of phase electricity, electric coefficient. Therefore, we propose that these monolayers will be suitable for the uh, for flexible feed source spectronics. And our findings and similar findings we have summarized, we have compiled and reviewed in this article, in this invited topical review, which I was uh, asked to invite to contribute last year. So it's time to switch the gear to Van der Waals heterostructures. And Van der Waals heterostructures have mainly been explored, have mainly been studied in light harvesting applications, for example, in photovoltaics and in photodialysis. Because of the type of band alignment, if the electron hole pairs can be spatially separated out in the two individual monolayers. And now, as Professor Pandey mentioned in the morning, interface driven properties were overlooked. So for example, so if, if uh, piezoelectricity which can, which might arise from the interface effects or from the interfacial polarization, that was completely overlooked until, I mean, piezoelectricity, Van der Waals, heterostructures were completely overlooked until we predicted it for the first time in this paper. <coughs> And we have an evidence to substantiate the claim, and kindly bear with me, I'll show the evidence in the next few slides. So what Manish did that is that he designed this Van der Waals hetero bilayer consisting of a single layer of boron monophosphide stacked on top of gallium nitride monolayer. And these uh, monolayers are very close in the lattice constant, and therefore computationally it is not uh, demanding to handle such calculations. And experimentally also these graphite nanosheets, they exist, so they are good because of experimental relevance. And now these individual monolayers, they only show interplane piece of electricity. They do not show any out of plane piece of electricity until when one is stacked on top of the other. When one is stacked on top of the other to form a Van der Waals retro structure, an out of plane electric uh, out of plane piece of electricity arises, which is sensitive to the stacking order. And in this stacking order, when the layers are in perfect registry with one another, the interface dipoles are perfectly oriented along the z direction. The highest level of out of plane piece of electricity. <coughs> arises in it. And then uh, we have asserted the origin of this out of plane piece electricity. It owes its origin to the difference in the electrostatic potential between the individual monolayers. The negative gradient of this potential builds up an electric field along the z direction, out of plane electric field, which polarizes the electronic cloud on the van der Waals hetero bilayer, which is evident from this oscillations in the deformation charge density, alternating spatial regions of charge accumulation and charge depletion. So then we have uh, tested our understanding on other systems. The understanding that is which is reached here, whether it is generally applicable to other Van der Waals So what we have done is that we have replaced gallium nitride by a monolayer which is similar to gallium nitride, close in the lattice constant to boron monophosphide and gallium nitride. So that's what we have done here. We have replaced uh, gallium nitride by MOS2, molybdenum disulfide. And we find that our understanding is reinforced in this Van der Waals central bilayer as well. And here, what we find again, interface driven properties. So, if the two monolayers, when they are subject to a vertical compressive strain, there's a fourfold enhancement in the out of plane peak to electricity. Now, moving on. So, now jammer structures have been experimentally synthesized. So, MOSSE has been experimentally grown, synthesized. So, what if we replace MOS2 by MOS, MOSSE. So if we introduce a mild out-of-plane polarization in one of the individual monolayers, in one of the monolayers, we find that there is a five-fold enhancement in the out-of-plane piezoelectric coefficient, and which has been confirmed experimentally on a similar system. So in summary, these are the first theoretical predictions on the occurrence of out-of-plane out of plane piezoelectricity in Van der Waals hydrobilayer, which has been on a similar system, and they have cited our papers, and that's how we have come to know. And also, in this review article, they have newly acknowledged us. Piezoelectricity in Van der Waals structures was first predicted by Mohanta et al. Manish Mohanta happens to be my former PhD student. And our work on Jana structures have also been discussed in this review article. So now, uh, we usually calculate the piezoelectric uh, coefficients. Experimentally, we measure the piezoelectric coefficients, but we usually ignore the sign of the piezoelectric coefficients. The sign of the piezoelectric coefficients can be important from even, even from fundamental perspectives. 
So we have ascertained the origin of the negative piezoelectric coefficient. We find that it arises from a small out of plane piezo uh, from a small out of plane elastic stiffness constant. In Van der Waals heterovibrators, you have a small uh, out of plane elastic stiffness constant. So that gives rise to a negative out of plane piezoelectricity. That is what we find over here. And these monolayers, they, they exhibit, they show a nearly thick electron gas states having a parabolic dispersion similar to that of graphene. This arises from the image potential surface states as in graphene. And when in this Van der Waals heterobilayer, this is uh, when the electric field is applied along plus z or minus z direction, either along, along this or this direction, these NFEG states, they reach the Fermi level and enhance the electrical conductivity. When plus electric field is applied along the plus Z direction, the red bands of Na2P move upward when relative to that of the blue bands of CS2S. And when negative electric field is applied, the band movement is opposite. And now the closing and the opening of the band gap in the presence and absence of electric field, this thing can be utilized in digital electronics. And now, now coming to Van der Waals uh, solids, so non-Van der Waals solids, non-Van der Waals solids. Normal solids are non-Van der Waals solids, right? And uh, the normal solids are more, much more abundant than the Van der Waals solid. Normal solids are more abundant than the Van der Waals solids, such as graphite or MOS2. And the usage and applications of the normal solids or non-Van der Waals solids are much higher than that of the Van der Waals solids. And also, recently, experimentally, a few layers of normal solids have been exfoliated, and the success uh, in the uh, the success in the experimental exfoliation of a few layers of a normal solid has stimulated a surge in research interest in non van der Waals solid. So here, these scandium nitride monolayers they are stable in the woodlike phase in the bulk structure. So computationally, we have exfoliated a single layer of scandium nitride and we have optimized it. It is found to be stable and having a hexagonal honeycomb lattice structure and it shows a very small uh, Young's model, so therefore it is super flexible. And then we have explored several other properties in uh, scandium nitride monolayers. So usually V16, this is V16, I think this is not so, uh, okay. The clarity in the pictures, okay. V16 is the shear piezoelectric coefficients these are normally overlooked and ignored in two-dimensional materials, and they are usually studied in hexa in helical structures such as DNA nucleobases. And interestingly, this this monolayers they show a shear piezoelectricity. Shear piezoelectricity is like this: if you apply a torsion, a shear about the z direction, polarization is induced along the x direction. And so under the application of biaxial strain, we find that there is a complex mixing of these three phonon modes. They are most sensitive to the application of strain. The other strain mode, the other phonon modes are relatively insensitive to the application of strain. And that is what is understood to enhance the piezoelectric, the, the shear piezoelectric coefficient in these monolayers. And, uh, and so the systematic variation it, is observed. With piezoelectric coefficient of with the application of biaxial strain. And under the application of biaxial strain, the piezoelectric coefficient V16 reaches exceeds that of beta glycine molecule, which shows the highest V16. And if we pay attention to the top of the valence band, we find a heavy hole band and a light hole band. So now the in plane orbitals constitute the light hole band, this and the out of plane. The, the nearly flat bands arise from the out of plane orbitals. So, therefore, if strain is applied, the hybridization between the out of plane orbitals gets reduced. So, the bandwidth is reduced. So, therefore, strain flattens the bands further. That's what we understand from here. Okay. So, moving on. Professor Sakar, another two, three minutes. Three minutes? Yeah. Three. So as I mentioned, serendipitously we have come across an ohmic contact in this van der Waals idea. I mean, materials that we study are primarily utilized in devices, mm -hmm. therefore it is very important to understand the device properties. And the uh, occurrence of ohmic contacts are rare and uncommon, and serendipitously we have found it in this van der Waals when MPS is stacked on top of graphene, that means when the Schottky barrier is zero. 
So now the nature of the OB contact, whether it's an n-type OB contact or a p-type OB contact, is found to be sensitive to the stacking sequence, whether the chalcogen atoms face graphene or the magnesium atoms face graphene, because the it, this, this is a uh, the band alignment in the absolute backworm scale, and when the interface is formed, when the van der Waals layer is formed, the potential step is different. It varies from one uh, to the other because the interfacial polarization varies from one stack, stacking sequence to the other. So in the end, we get an n-type OB contact in this uh, stacking sequence and a p-type in this case. And then we have also opened the band gap in graphene by the application uh, of vertical compressive strain. This has relevance to Professor Pandey's uh, talk in the morning. So when the two layers are brought closer to one another, what happens is that there's a strong hybridization to, to the SPZ and CPZ orbitals. And when you are going past the uh, equilibrium distance of separation, so you are, there's, a, there's a strong Coulomb repulsion. So a cumulative effect of these two factors uh, facilitates the opening of the band. But the band gap which is opened is much higher than the ones reported earlier. And also, apart from the pursuit of our independent theoretical research, we also collaborate with experimentalists and we provide them the strong theoretical support on different research areas. Like this is uh, catalysis, this is luminescence in atomic clusters, 2D materials, and so on. Light harvesting, and so on. And hope I'm able to finish on time. Thank you for your. I skipped this in the interest of time. And since I'm standing between you and the lunch, I skip this. And thank you for your kind attention. I'm really sorry to stop you there. I know that you have a lot of data and lot more to discuss with the audience. But I think that we have the time limitation. But still, I will open the all one or two quick questions. I'm just, uh, if you could again. Give us your uh, overall view because I noticed for DP, you said the lattice match. Mm -hmm. So, lattice matching is really essential requirement. Or one can, yeah. So, for the calculation to be less complicated, yeah, fine. Yeah, but I'm talking physics wise. Yeah, physics wise. Physics wise, the lattice match is not, uh, not important actually. So, this so is not the, the It's not the second thing is I noticed for D33, I think DP MOS2, mm -hmm. with the strain, it really collapses. Yes. So any physical insight is yeah. Then we calculated this anisotropy. We uh, some anisotropy indices we have calculated because the heat selective coefficients are also related to the elastic stiffness constant. The higher the anisotropy index, higher is the heat electricity. At that, at five percent of your strain, the anisotropy index that drops down. That's the reason it collapses. <laughs> any other question, please? So no question. Please join me in thanking Professor Kar for the brilliant lecture. Okay, yeah, yeah, sure. Sorry. We are doing Vishal's work in Genus to the EMBS materials, and we have taken transition metal ionium and tantalum with sulfur, selenium, or tantalum. Uh, I have. Uh, uh, found in bulk material, there is metallic properties, uh, properties we have found. We are trying to make uh, semiconducting or half metal. So, we have made monolayer also. So, it's, uh, monolayer will be sufficient to give half metal or semiconducting materials or to <coughs> substitute it will elements. Which types of elements we have to substitute? That is, a, that is you see. In the bulk, it is metallic. What is the material you mentioned? Can you please? NB, NBSES. 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 So NBS2, you have made a Jana structure of NBS2. Yeah. Okay. In the bulk, in the in monolayer phase. Yeah. Mm. Actually, the monolayer is metallic or is it half metallic? What is, what is the monolayer? We haven't tried what we are trying to substitute with the iron like this. We yes. haven't found, we are trying, just we have found a super shell like 2 by 2. But NBS2 recipe is metallic, I as I understand. You want yeah. to make it half metallic. We are trying, yeah. to, trying to make it half metallic. metallic. Yeah. With selenium, you are trying with tellurium also, you can try. It would be difficult, I guess, with tellurium. Yeah. Or with uh, niktides. Uh, 
or halogens also you can give it a try. Let's see which one works. It's hard to predict. We can do a calculation, electronic structure calculations, and then we can see which one will work. That can save you the save the time and if we use halogen, yes. then we need to meet the Rasabi test. We will what need to follow the Rasabi test or Zalu's properties. Rasabi yeah. test. Yeah. If there is an out, yes, it will induce an out of plane electric field actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It is a Jana structure and that will help to induce the Rasabi test. Okay. Okay. We will try as well. Okay. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other question, please? Yeah. I think we, actually we are not uh, till now, but 2D material is coming in all respects, like sensors and others. So, uh, my question is as you are talking about that uh, type 2 quantum oil, so uh, type 2 quantum oil, so where there is a band, band, band offset is there. And although the uh, electron and volts are in the like in different uh, well condition, that means they are already separated. So scattering is already reduced. Mm -hmm. So in that case, I think the mobility will be very much higher in that case. Yeah. But it is uh, like 1D mobility now, or it is the uh, jumping or a kind of mobility. You're like quasi 2D. Right, 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 Electrons are in one layer, holes are in the other, other layer. layer. Now they are motion, if you are extracted or any transport it requires, then uh, in which direction? It will be one dimensional motion? No, or actually, because the electron, suppose it is in this 2D layer, mm -hmm. so the electron mobility will be specific to the mobility of this layer. And the hole is in the other layer, so the mobility will be of that layer. So that layer in the direction of uh, plane, in plane, or if it is perpendicular maybe for the thickness in it will end up in, in, like, in, in, in like in different because state quantum because, mobility that i am asking because in the z direction you do not have any dispersion actually the dispersion is only the x y thing the mobility will be the x y but in z direction you will be getting a kind of energy level because yes. the thickness yes. is very thin right. so uh, you will be getting a kind of Hopping kind of mobility or the, uh, that Very kind small of mobility along the z direction. I would expect mobility only along only in the in plane only. Okay. Any other question, please? I think everybody is feeling hungry. So, but we still have one presentation of ten minutes. Oral presentation. For the oral presentation, I would like to invite BS Boshi. Assistant Professor of IIT Allahabad. So please come to the stage. So please wait a moment. I would also like to present a moderator to our honorable speaker. Very good afternoon. Uh, I'm Dr. Shanti and uh, uh, the topic uh, about which I'm going to talk today is quantum capacitance in near uh, near valence doped steady nanosheets for prismatic supercapacitors. To talk about the introduction, um, to talk about supercapacitors, supercapacitor is an empty storage device and it combines the good attributes of both the battery and the capacitor. If you look at a battery, it offers high energy storage, but its charging and discharge process is very slow. But if you look at a capacitor, its charging and discharging happens very quickly, but the energy storage capacity is very low. And the supercapacitor combines the positive attributes of both things. It offers a good energy storage capacity and rapid charge discharging ability. Uh, and the application of the supercapacitors. Uh, we usually, uh, the supercapacitor is usually preferred in the places wherever we put the rapid burst of power, uh, such as camera flashes, or wherever we don't need regular maintenance, we require less maintenance, such as space applications. However, um, supercapacitors, they also have uh, one issue, which is the energy storage capacity. 
So in comparison to normal capacitors, and this storage capacity is high, but when we compare it the same with uh, batteries, its energy storage capacity is quite low. If we look at the lithium ion battery, the energy storage density is 120 to 170 watt half per kg. For nickel, nickel metal halide is 40 to 100. For lead acid battery, it is 20 to 35, but for super capacity, it is 5 to 10 watt half per kg. Um, so, this research. Um, by using computational means, it ends up increasing the energy storage capacity of the super capacitor. By enhancing the quantum capacitance of the electrodes, by enhancing the quantum capacitance, we can enhance the specific capacitance. By enhancing the specific capacitance, we can enhance the energy storage capacity or energy density. Uh, coming to the calculation mechanism, um, the quantum capacitance can be calculated using um, uh, few mathematical expressions. So that uh, first we need the density of states data, which can be extracted using the density function theory tools. Uh, after extracting the density of states data, we have to do some uh, MATLAB programming, or we can use any other programming. Uh, so we can use also C programming or MATLAB. And here I have used the C pro uh, MATLAB programming. And this is the expression for the charge density and um, D of e is the density of states, f of e is the Fermi Dirac distribution function, and this is the Fermi Dirac distribution function with respect to the uplet potentials. And uh, after um, differentiating the charge density with respect to the uplet potential, we get the uh, differential quantum capacitance. And after integrating the differential quantum capacitance with respect to the uplet potentials, we get the integrated quantum capacitance. And this integrated quantum capacitance um, it matches very well with the experimental report. First, we have referred the same for the Christian Griffin. For Christian Griffin, the red curve is the experimental uh, quantum capacitance, and the black curve is the computational quantum capacitance, and they are in very good increment. And after uh, verifying the process, we move, I move to staining. Um, I have taken staining. Um, uh, first, I have uh, analyzed the Christian staining. And in Christian staining, uh, first we have extracted the density of states, and we have uh, confirmed that, that um, staining also offers. Zero band gap just like graphene. Uh, but the PDOS it shows there are S states and B states. If you look at graphene, we uh, we know specific S states for Christian graphene because of the SP2 hybridization. But in staining, we are having both P states and S states, and the presence of P states indicates there is SP3 hybridization also. And the report says staining is SP2 SP3 coexistent hybridization. And uh, this is the quantum capacitance curve for uh, Christian staining and the charge storage curve also. Uh, the quantum capacitance offered by the Christian staining is um, around 77 microfarad per centimeter square, which is about seven times higher than the Christian graphene. So, staining offering, offering around seven times higher quantum capacitance than graphene. Uh, to explore different ways of enhancing the quantum capacitance of staining further, we have introduced this uh, vacancy defect in staining. After introducing the vacancy defect, we have found that the band gap is still zero. But uh, the quantum capacitance, yes, it increased very much. The new quantum capacitance is approximately 120 microfarad per centimeter square, that is 77. And the vacancy defect increased the quantum capacitance to 120 microfarads. Uh, however, uh, when we see the formation energy, the stability it is compromised, and uh, uh, the formation energy shows um, the formation energy is positive here. It means the structure is unstable. So, to increase the stability and to improve the quantum capacitance, we uh, positioned the near valency dopants, indium and the antimony, at the SV site. At the SV site, we have placed indium and antimony. And positioning the indium and antimony uh, has improved the stability. Uh, we can see the negative uh, value of the formation energy here. And the quantum capacitance also increased uh, very much. It is 116 microfarads per centimeter square uh, in comparison to pristine uh, staining of 77. Similarly, for antimony, it is 107. <coughs> uh, to further uh, study the same, um, Further study the different uh, mechanisms. We have introduced the 
uh, this linear valence is opened, indium and antimony at the SP edges, single vacancy edges. So initially one indium is positioned at the single vacancy edge of the vacancy edges. Thereafter two indium atom dopants are positioned at the SP edges. Thereafter three indium atoms are positioned at the SP edges. And similarly the antimony dopants also positioned at the SP edges. And we have seen that as we are positioning more number of dopants at the SP edges, the stability is increasing. This can be attributed to the um, elimination of dangling bonds by positioning these dopant atoms. And we have observed that the antimony offers better thermodynamic stability in comparison to indium in Spain. Because when we position antimony, the antimony can offer a lone pair, but indium it cannot offer a lone pair. So we think this is the reason um, we are getting better stability for antimony in comparison to indium. And all these uh, indium antimony dopants, they are offering a quantum capacitance on the positive side of the electrotechnical window. And this says uh, all these dopant structures, they are suitable for the anode electrode of the asymmetric, uh, asymmetric supercapacitor rather than the symmetric supercapacitor because the quantum capacitance peaks are up to on the one side only. So we can say that these are suitable for anode of asymmetric supercapacitor. And, uh, so this is the data we can see here when we do the one indium um, and when we do one antimony, the antimony is offering better thermodynamic stability than indium. Similarly, when we do two indium and two antimony, the two antimony is offering better thermodynamic stability. Similarly, when we are doing three antimony, we are getting better thermodynamic stability. And the antimony it is offering better thermodynamic stability and it is also offering better quantum capacitance in comparison to indium. So we can say uh, in an steady antimony is a better dopant in comparison to indium. And the, since these are near valence, uh, uh, antimony is a near valence dopant, so there will be less thermodynamic, uh, less lattice distortion as well. And uh, next we have studied the co-doping of uh, indium and antimony in stellium. And uh, we have positioned this indium and antimony simultaneously in the stellium uh, at different locations. Uh, at the SV edges, single vacancy edges, and at the normal sheet also. And we have found that still these codoped structures are also suitable for the anode electrode of asymmetric supercapacitor because the quantum capacitance peaks are available on the positive side of the electrode integrator. And um, looking at the stability data and the quantum capacitance data, the quantum capacitance peaks are lower in comparison to the individual dopants. And when we do the individual dopants at the SP edges, we are having better quantum capacitance. Uh, but when we are co-doping, when we are co-doping the indium and antimony, uh, the quantum capacitance peaks are less. So we can say co-doping uh, instead of co-doping, it's better to go with the antimony doping in staining. Yes, this is the conclusion. So the conclusion says uh, staining it offers seven times higher quantum capacitance than uh, and uh, antimony is a better dopant in comparison to uh, indium and co-doping is uh, not that much suitable or uh, may, may not be advantageous. Yeah. These are the references and uh, thank you. Thank you Mr. Swaminathan, thank you for the very good lecture. So, if any question please. We have to visit on it. No, yeah, madam, please. So, two questions actually. One is that we didn't do the dipole correction, we didn't do the vacancy calculation. No, no, sorry. sorry. Dipole correction. Okay. Second is that you have a very definite kind of arrangement of uh, atom doping around the vacancy. Experimentally, how one can realize that? Now, how one can realize that? You don't know, but how? how we are studying the full possibility conditions can go in any body. So in simulation we are doing all the possible. So the experimental is doing all the possible. So you say co-doping is didn't do anything. So what is the physics behind it? What does co-doping do? Uh, maybe it's like uh, in the choice of dopant is like 
Sorry, any other question, please? So, no question. So, I think it is time to go for lunch. But before I go for lunch, I have one question for Mr. Swami Nathan. In your lecture, you generally mentioned that the, your agreement it was very good. But my point is that when you see it in a general statement, so when you give such kind of statement, it's better to give quantitative. How much is the percentage? It is 5%, 2%, 3%. And the second thing is when you do the experiment, take into consideration the uncertainty that is uh, there in measuring the various instruments, using the various instruments. Because many times what happened that somebody says that I have my efficiency is 42 percent, okay, and then the literature it is 40 percent. So that means he said that I have improved the system because my efficiency is 2 percent. In practical, he is right, but the thing is nobody takes into consideration the uncertainty in the measurement of the various uh, you know this parameter using various instruments. So these two points I would like to take into your or your consideration. Thank you. Okay, so once again, I thank all the uh, you know audience, and uh, I would like to thank all the speaker for their brilliant lectures. So now I invite the organizer since he has to say something. I request everyone to kindly proceed for the lunch. We will meet again after thirty minutes. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank Thank <laughs> you.